want to start off today with a, a wonder volunteer, one of the kids who wants to be a volunteer. First hand to go up. First hand to go up. Okay, come, Jaren. I'm going to hold out something over here to you, Jaren. And Yebi wants you to make a pick. What are you going to pick, mate? Do you want the paper? Open up the paper. Open it up, mate. You think there's something in it? You think there's something in it, Jaron? No? Yet you just picked the paper. This is amazing. It went con totally contrary to what I was expected. Open it up, open it up, Jaron. What? Check it out. Look at that. Five bucks? It's yours, mate. Go for it. You can go and buy yourself six or seven of these now. Thanks, Jaron. Give Jaron a hand, everybody. You've done extremely well. Good on you, Jay. Thank you very much. All right? You can give that. Uh, Yebi will throw that away, okay? So what just happened there? What just happened there? What were you going for? Well, I was going to go for the stupid paper. I'm going to go for the lolly. Hey? Have you seen this before somewhere, Jerry? You see, this is so easy how our perceptions can be so misleading. Because at the end of the day, our perceptions is ultimately going to determine our actions. Wow, that kid has got a brilliant, bright future ahead of him. He needs sunglasses to put on to look at it. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Righto. I want to tell a couple of, couple of dad jokes, if that's okay. Yeah. Pastor Ken, who does mice spray to? Mice. They pray to cheese us. <laughs> they pray to cheese us. Now, if Jesus happened to have driven a car here on earth, what would it be? It'd be a Chrysler. That's it. He'd be driving a Chrysler. Yeah? How long was Cain angry at his brother for? Who knows that? For as long as he was able. Yeah? <laughs> yeah, very much dad jokes. And I'll end with this one. How many apples grows on the tree? Oh, come on, Zeldin, you gave it away. <laughs> yeah, all of them. All of them. You see, it's really, it's really essential that we start off with good perceptions. All right? As I said, that our perceptions will ultimately determine the outcome of our actions. Now, I want to tell you a story, and I want you to really listen and focus on this story that I'm going to tell you right now. There was a father who had a son. And the mother unfortunately passed away at a very young age. And this father was a businessman, so he had been working very hard building up this business. So what happened is, is, is that with the child going to school, him and his father grew distant from one another in their relationship because he was so devoted to building up this business. And then the child went to high school, and then it came time for him to go to college. But at that point in time, they were this, that distant from one another. So he went off to college. And he's been there. And just on the last year, as he turned into his senior year, he just really felt in his heart that there was a hole in his heart that he needed to get close to his father again. So he called him up. And he started spending the weekends at, back at home again. And he started to build on this relationship and the healing and the restoration taking place between this boy and his father. Now one day as they were driving in town, they drove past a car dealership. And this son of his saw a great, beautiful convertible that he wanted. And he said to his dad, Hey dad, once I finish and I graduate from college, I would like that convertible. 
as a present. So, and he just absolutely rammed that into everyone's ear that he knew. Every family member, every friend, every family friend. And whenever the father gets around them, they would just drop it on them. It's like, you know what, your son has got really good grades. And he really, really, really wants that convertible. And then it came time that this boy graduated. The father was there, very proud of his son. He got extinctions. So a very proud father. So afterwards, he took him. They went out to a restaurant and afterward went back home. And he went into his study and he sat down at his chair and his son on the other side. And the father took off the shelf, he took parcel wrapped up and he put it on the table and his, his son looked at it and immediately in dismay and disappointment he's been looking at that and his father said to him there you go, open it up so this boy come and he opened it up and as he started unwrapping it he was even more disappointed to the point where he, he was angry because what it was is it was a Bible with his name engraved in it. And the son looked at it and he pushed it across the table back to his father and he said, Really, Dad? Really? Is that what you're going to give me? A book full of promises? He said, I don't need that right now, Dad. That's not what I want. That's not what I've asked for. And the son turned around and the father said, but son, hang on. Don't you just want to open it up and see what, what I said in there for you? And he just kept on walking. He went upstairs. He packed all his stuff. He went downstairs and he left his father's house. He went and he ventured on. And in a secular world, he himself used his father's name and because he was such a successful businessman he pulled a few strings by the use of his father's name he landed a very good job but then he got a promotion he became very 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 wealthy and then he met a girl which he married but he never let his dad in on it never called him invited him to their marriage and then they had the first child never let the dad know that he had a baby, that he's a granddaddy. And it was when they had their second child that this son once again had that notion in his heart of the emptiness, the voidness, because he was so distant from his father and, and yet again he felt the urge to connect with his father again. So he picked up the phone and he spoke to his dad and he said to him, Dad, I want to make things right. I want to introduce you to my family. I want you to meet your grandbabies. And you have a wonderful daughter-in-law that I want, to, I want you to come and meet. So they set up a meeting. And it was going to take place in a week's time. So they were just so excited. The kids were excited to meet the grandfather for the first time. The father himself was anticipating with such joy to just see his son again. And as they made themselves ready, the father suffered a heart attack. And unfortunately, suddenly he died. He passed away. So the son went about all the, the dealings around his funeral, as well as taking care of the business because he was the, you know, he was the sole in air, that's it. The sole heir to his dad. So he's just been dealing with some business stuff. And then he come back into his father's office. And he sat in his dad's chair. The table was still covered with business papers and deals going through. And as he sat there, he noticed on the top of the shelf that there was the same wrapping. He recognized that wrapping. So he stood up and he took it, he came and sat down again and he looked at this Bible, he took it out. 
And then he noticed that there was a bookmarker in it. So he opened it up at the bookmarker and it was open at Matthew 7. Where Jesus said that if evil people know how to do good unto their children, how much more would your Father in heaven give unto the, you the Holy Spirit unto those who ask him? He read that. He took the Bible, picked it up. Just think about this. And he pushed it against his heart. And as he'd done that, with such emotion and feeling such loss, a key fell out. He looked at the key. He picked it up. He looked at it and he noticed that this was a key to a car. So he went down into the basement, into the, the garage, and he saw right in the back against the wall that there was a car covered with a cover, and there was dust all over it. He walked over and he pulled the cover off, and what he had seen was the convertible that he asked his dad for, and said to him that he so greatly desired. You see, the thing is, sometimes in life we ask God for things. But it comes in a wrapping, in a way that we do not expect. The same as this boy had done. So it is essential that we have the correct perception. Because ultimately our perception is going to determine the outcome of our actions. So the thing is, sometimes we ask God for something, but the package and the wrapping that it is sent in to us, and that's why I've done that illustration. It's like, look at that. There was, there was $5 wrapped up in the newspaper. It didn't go as I said that I thought it was, but I thought that little Jaron was going to go for for this, well, who can resist a curly whirly? Who's ever had a curly whirly? It's the bomb. I'm telling you, I'm going to take one of them up with me at the rapture and eat it on the way. They're that good. <laughs> but that's the thing. God, we ask God for something. We ask God, make me great. I want to be great. And then God sends us what we ask for, but only for us to look at it and go, well, this is not what I asked for. Because the, 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 the wrapping is nothing that I've believed in for. So with disappointment and, 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 and sometimes with, with anger, we just push back unto him what he had given us. If we don't wait on the Lord and we don't trust in the Lord, and we do not stand in faith in the Lord, we can push back across the table, back to the Father, that which He has provided and given us. That's what we asked for. And today, I want to talk to you about the life of Joseph. I've read the whole story of Joseph again back to front it happened in the life of Joseph Joseph wanted to be great he was 17 years old and he come to his brothers and he's been telling them his dreams and his brothers hated him for it remember that they absolutely hated him for it but yet it's a gift that God has given him and he saw himself how his brothers bowed down to him and his father at one stage when he told his, his father, Jacob, Jacob even thought, you know, he's a bit, you know, arrogant. But this is what was in, in, in Joseph's heart. So Joseph was just getting on his brother's nerves. And they plotted on how they could kill him. He was wearing his coat of many colors. And then he went out to check up on him. And what did they do? They ripped the coat off him and they threw him in a pit. They sold him as a slave. 
Into Egypt he went to be picked up by Potiphar. That correct pronunciation? Potiphar. Potiphar. Afrikaans, for those who want to know. Potiphar. Say it back, Potiphar. Good job. So Potiphar, he was in his house. He served him well. The Bible says that the Lord was with him. The Lord was with Joseph. And then what happened to Joseph? The Bible says that he was a man, his frame and his countenance, he was a handsome boy. So Potiphar's wife wanted to, to push herself on him. He rejected, she, and he, she had his coat. Remember? And then he ran off and she falsely accused him. And when Potiphar came back and she told him what had happened, he arose in anger. His anger was aroused. And he got Joseph thrown into jail. And there Joseph was in jail for 13 years. But God, I want to be great. I had this dream. I'm in jail for 13 years. He befriended everyone there. And at one time, the king's butler and his baker was thrown in there as well. Remember that? So these two had a dream each. And Joseph said, hey, God is speaking to you. I can interpret these dreams for you. So Joseph gave him the interpretation to the baker and to the butler. Remember what happened to the baker? But the butler was restored. After three days, he was going to be restored. And he'll be putting the cup and pour into it as it's in the hand of Pharaoh. So he was restored. And Joseph only asked him, please remember me. My goodness, this guy has given me some good news. No way I'm going to forget about him. I've been restored. Hallelujah. Hey, king, please. This is what's happened. There's a man called Joseph. No, it didn't happen. He forgot about him. But there come a time when Pharaoh had a dream at night. And then he woke up and he went to sleep and he had another dream. And then he was troubled in his spirit. In his heart he was troubled about this. He got all of his counselors, all of them to come and interpret what this dream means. But none of them could give him the interpretation. No one could. But then the butler remembered. Ah, oh. he said, Lord, there is a man in the dungeon. His name is Joseph that can interpret dreams. And he then told Pharaoh what had happened to him and the baker. And what he had said come to pass. So at once Pharaoh said, let him come. So they sent for him, they shaved him, then they put in some nice clothing, good apparel, so then presented him before Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said unto him what his dream was. And Joseph acknowledged that it is a dream from the Lord. God has been speaking to him. And what happened? Right there, Pharaoh had made Joseph governor of all of Egypt. He was second to Pharaoh. You see how the gift, the, the, the Bible teaches us that your gift will make room for you. You see how the gift of Joseph had made room for him. But the thing is, it was wrapped in such a strange package. How many years and years have passed? You see, we don't just step into greatness. If we ask God for something, He's going to give it to us. But we should not be surprised as we look in what sort of packaging it is that He's going to send it. We'll be reading some scripture very shortly. I'm going to try and see where I'm at over here just for a second.
So you and I ask God for something, but it's not just about giving it to you. It's about Him preparing you to handle that what it is that you asked Him for. There's a preparation period. So if we're going to do new, God wants us to. But we have to engage in God's plan. In God's way. It's the process that we go through that prepares our soul and that prepares our heart. And it's in the suffering, in the hurting and in the waiting that God starts to fashion and mold and shape us. To be able to carry that. It's not just in the high times. It's not just in the high times. We don't just get it from God. It's about becoming what it is that God called you to be. That's what it is about. It's about becoming what God has called you and I to be. And the thing is that He is going to send us. He is going to send us some answers that is in a different wrapping than what we anticipate. And we know also that Joseph revealed himself unto his brothers. Man, when I read that part, I was just so, so struck in my heart. I teared up every time. I just had tears covering the page of my Bible. Like he was so humble. And these words, the words that he spoke unto his brothers... He even said to them, do not condemn yourselves for doing the wrong thing. You have done nothing wrong. You see the attitude? It's going to cost for us to have the right attitude. For what we endure, we're going to have to have the right attitude. You can have potential, but without belief, you won't have confidence. Confidence is the product of belief. And attitude depends on that. We should have a can-do mentality. We should have a can-do attitude. I can do this. I can overcome. I can be what he has called me to be. Because he said it in his word. So let's go to Genesis chapter 45 and we'll read from verse 5. So Genesis 45, verse 5 to 8. But now do not therefore be grieved. This is now Joseph talking unto his brothers. But now do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For these two years the famine has been in the land and there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. And God sent me before you to preserve the prosperity for you in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. And listen to this, verse 8. So now it was not you who sent me here, but God. Now I want to take you back to a promise that we so very well know. And that is the book of Jeremiah, chapter 29 and verse 11. God says, for I know the thoughts that I have for you, that I think toward you. Thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. You see, that is the first base where Joseph started off at. God had put it in his heart what it is that he called him to. And God is the one 
that ordains the steps of a righteous man. The steps of a righteous man, they are ordered by God. So we need to just stay in that place of trust and of belief. As we stick to the promises that he has given us in this book. And it doesn't matter what sort of wrapping the, the gifts are going to be sent to us in. We should always have the right perception. That God knows best. He knows what he's doing. It's going to involve pain, disappointment, get discouraged, get offended. But see, the thing is, is if we know what it is that God has called us to, we only go one way and that's forward. And on the way, God is going to put us through some schooling. God knows what he is doing. He knows what he's doing. That is a promise, not just to Joseph, to each and every one of us. God says, I have the plan for you, Beck. I know the plans that I think toward you. He knows them. Thoughts of peace and not of evil. That's why Joseph could say that. You see now, it was not you who sent me here, but it was God. So do not be surprised if in your life you encounter some trouble. If you encounter some pain. Because God is at work. Even though I cannot see it, I know that He is working. Even though I don't feel it, He's working. You see, the thing is, I wasn't prepared for this, but I'm just thinking about that right now. But Paul, the Apostle Paul, on the road to Damascus, when he encountered Jesus in the light, when he went to Long Street and he tarried there, and Jesus sent... Philip, over there, to pray for him. What is it that God said to him? God said to Paul, I am going to use you mightily. You are going to be presented before kings and high people. So God, God gave him his calling his plan for his life right there. And when even he was shipwrecked. Remember when they were shipwrecked? Paul was there among the locals who made a fire. And Paul was there and he put some fire wood on the fire and a viper latched onto his arm. And all Paul had done is, is that he just took his arm over the fire and he shook it off. And he went on about talking to them. The Bible says that these guys, they were looking at him, waiting for him to die. And then after a long time, when they perceived that this guy is not going to die, they thought of him to be a god. Have you ever read that? They thought of him to be a god. The thing is, where did Paul's confidence come from? It was in that vision and mission statement that God made for his life. And he said, well, if God, if God said that, and that's God's plan for me, then let it be unto me according to his word. How many times have we seen this over and over, repeated in the word? Even the mother Mary when the angels come to her. She said, let it be. I can't see how that's going to be, but if that's your plan, let's go. Let it be. Let it be unto me according to your word. And that's where Paul's confidence was in, is that he trusted in God. 
He put his faith in God. That he followed, he followed the instructions of the Lord. You see, complaining is not going to get us there. Whinging and whining is not going to get us there. In fact, the Bible says to us that we ought to do all things without complaint. Without whining, without whinging. We've got work to do. Your life matters. You matter. Will you matter? Paul, your life matters. So much value. So much value in each and every one of us. We need to believe that about ourselves. Have you received your vision and mission statement from God yet? Because it's so liberating to be walking into what you know what it is that God had called you to. It's so liberating. Pastor Ken, a phenomenal book writer. Hi. Listen to this. The tree is not in the soil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look at me like that. It's true. The tree is not in the soil. If you look at a seed, the tree is trapped in the seed. If that seed is taken and it's put in on the windowsill, or you put it in a cupboard in a dark place, for 50 years, it's going to stay trapped. The seed becomes a victim to its environment. But if you take that seed and you put it in the soil and you water it, what's going to happen? It's going to become a tree. You are a seed sent by God to earth. What's trapped on the inside of you? Ben, what's trapped on the inside of you? That God wants to see just absolutely bloom and produce fruit so that others could benefit from it. Look at Joseph. Look at Joseph's life. It come to pass what he had dreamed. Where his brothers were bowing down to him. It happened. He became the most influential and powerful man in that time. The governor of Egypt. What's trapped on the inside of you? You see, the thing is, if you take that seed and you put it in between rocks, that environment is not going to allow it to thrive. The rocks, what is that? That could be like whinging. Running and always complaining to people about other people. To just go through life with disappointment. Whenever it doesn't go your way, you have a pretty party. <laughs> Any people that does that? Yeah, we should slap that out of ourselves. <laughs> no. We can be confident. Look at this. Let's look at some more, some more promises in the word. Philippians 1 verse 6. Philippians 1 and verse 6. What's that say? Philippians 1 and verse 6 says the following. Being confident of this very thing. Being confident of this very thing. We need to be confident about this very thing. What thing? That he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. We should be confident in this thing. That the good work that he had started in us, he will complete 
Come on. The world is waiting to see who you are. God has provided us with the right environment, the soil. Coming over here, this is good soil. What is trapped on the inside of you? That you need to let take root in the right soil to produce the fruit of righteousness that he prepared before the foundation of the earth. You see, in God's hand, our lives can blossom and flourish. But there is preparation as well. So do not be surprised if you go through heartache. If you encounter opposition, that is just a gift wrapped in a different kind of wrapping other than what you expected it to be. We read last week about Obadiah that hid the 100 prophets in the cave. Were they confident? They were confident. They were gripped by fear at the name of Jezebel and Ahab. But Elijah, Elijah said, no, not me. He was confident because he knew who he was. He knew what he had to do. See, there needs, needs to be a knowing. We have to. Have you ever asked yourself that question? Why am I here? Man, I've done it a few times when I was younger to the point where my head hurt. Why am I here? And all I could just keep bumping into was all of my shortcomings. I would just have some sort of a, a reflection of what I think, what I want to do for God. And then all of a sudden the opposition comes. Yeah, you're afraid to stand in front of people. You can't talk in front of people. You've got stage fright. People used to make fun of me at school. I had drikes. What's that called in English? Bracelets. Oh, not braces. Bracelets on your teeth, man. Braces. In fact, my nickname as a little boy among the tribal people was Amazinho. Right now, I just want to say I want to give a thousand bucks to the one that knows what Amazinho means. Not you, Tonetti. Amazinho, okay, no, that's it. I'm not going to ask anyone. It means teeth. It's like, how would you like to be called? Hey, teeth. Your teeth, come here. You and Amazinho, was a lie. Because the gap between my teeth was that big, people used to say, your teeth remind me of the stars. It's not so shiny, but so far apart. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, so I had that hanging over me as well. I'm just like, oh, like Gideon. I'm the least of my tribe. I'm the smallest in my family. I had to overcome these things. Hey, the enemy is a liar. He is a liar. Don't listen to him. He's going to try and stop you. He's going to try and, 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 and dictate you with fear. With offenses. We spoke about that this morning, just before church. You remember what offenses means? It's the bait of Satan. He wants us to take offense. And as you lure a wild animal with bait into a trap, so the devil does that with offenses. He wants to take offense, to trap you. That's why we need the word. The word of God is a light onto our path. It's a lamp onto our feet. As long as the light is burning, we'll be able to see where we are going. We don't have to stumble in the dark. Jesus provided a way. He provided us a super highway. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. 
And we can walk on it. We can walk on it. I said to myself, there's no way that I am no more going to set myself the boundary to say that that's only up to there where I can go. Because of this, because of this, because of this, and that, and that. For this is my shortcomings, and I can't do this, I can't do that. Let God be the one. Let God be the one to decide that. But we have to start somewhere. We have to start at first base. And it's for you to believe it. Now let's just look at some, some, some good soil. Where's some scriptures talking about some good soil here? Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 14 to 19. So Ephesians chapter 3. Verse 14 to 19. Here we go. For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that He would grant you according to the riches of His glory, to be strengthened with might through His Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Rooted and grounded in love. Love never fails. If you are rooted and grounded in the love of God, we believe that God said that He has only got good in store for me. And not evil to harm me. But whatever the devil uses for harm, our God turns into good. So what the enemy meant for harm, our Father God, he turns it for our good. Look at Joseph. Look at Joseph. He is able to restore life. He is able to heal a broken heart. He is able to restore hope. You know, there's one thing too, as we go back into, into Genesis chapter 41. And here in verse 50 and 51, I was just meditating on that yesterday. Rolling it over and over in my mind. It's like, it stood out. It's like, Lord, this is very significant. So chapter 41 of Genesis and verse 50 says this. Joseph... And unto Joseph, so when, when, when he was in Egypt, he was made governor, Pharaoh gave him um, a wife, the daughter of Or, who was a priest. So, verse 50 says, And to Joseph were born two sons before the years of famine came, whom Azanath, the daughter of Poti, Pharaoh, priest of On, bore to him. And Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh, for God has made me forget all of my toil and all my father's house. And secondly, the name of the second he called Ephraim, for God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. You see, there it is revealed. God watches. He's watchful over His Word. We shouldn't be troubled on how it is that He is going to bring it about. It might come to you in a strangely wrapped package. But keep hope. Hallelujah. God knows what He is doing. 
You just stay with the plan. Stick to the plan. He's given us a remedy. He's given us a remedy. Look at, look at Paul and Silas. The same happened to them. They were wrongfully accused. They were thrown into the deepest of dungeons. What did them two boys do? Were they whinging? Were they whining? Now the thing is they whipped them. They were sore. They were bleeding. The same way that in life we get afflicted. We suffer pain. There's the Apostle Paul, Silas. They felt the full grunt of it. But look at their response. You see, this is why confidence in God is so important for us if we are going to do new. If you're going to do you new, we need this sort of confidence. These two boys done what they knew best. And that is that they put that garment of praise on and they started singing. They started thanking God, praising Him. And it wasn't, I know He rescued my soul. They belted it out because everyone in prison could hear them. You see, we should not be afraid of who it is that we are and to present that to the people outside of these walls. We should be confident in who we are in Christ. And we should showcase that out there, outside of the walls of this building. Joe wrote a song, Born for More. Sang that song over and over yesterday. I am confident. I am bold. I am dependable. I am born. I am born for more. Come on. What is it that you were born for? Why are you here? God destined you for greatness. He's got great plans for you. A future. And a hope. Let us not settle. Let us not settle for the least. There's so much more. Let there be a breakout. Come on, stop, stop just settling for the least. But start believing and trusting God that there's more. There is more than just waking up in the morning and brushing my teeth and comb my hair. There's more than to just go to Target and pick out a nice dress, you know, to wear on Saturday. There's more than to just go to this gathering on Saturday and see someone else wearing the same dress as you and feel all, you know, ah, I don't want to be here anymore. Ah, there's more to this life of yours than that. There's more to your life than just being a mom coming home and then just do the cooking and washing the clothes. That is a call. You are fulfilling a call of a mother. You're doing a great job. But there's more. Keep pushing into it. Keep pushing into God. Keep knocking. Keep asking. Stay on your knees. Stay prayerful. Push in. Lean into God. Where I am today wasn't just given to me on a plate. But God sent. God sent it. It came in strange packaging. I was standing right in front of the church. And there was about, I don't know, maybe 200 people. And the pastor just said, because he knew that my parents came to visit. He just said, and Iban, can you please close in prayer? Never in my life was I put on a spot like that. Ever in my life. I could not. I could, I could not get out a word. I could not get out a word. He was looking at me and it's just like, today, you know, like... <laughs> Today, any time now. Meantime, I was there having a panic attack. It come in those sort of forms. But every time, every time, 
It's just to stitch strategically. Been planned and ordained by God. It's like, my boy, I send you over here. Not just to live a mediocre life. I want your life to count. Because you are valuable in my eyes. And I am going to showcase my glory through you. I want you to love me, surrender to me, humble yourself. And let me, let me lead you. Let me guide you. Let me teach you. So do not be surprised if it comes in, 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 in all sorts of, you know, strange packaging. God knows what he's doing. We just need to come on board with his plan. Paul and Silas gave us a prime example that if we endure that, if we endure this hardship, we just need to put on our garment of praise. And we should just let it rip. Let loose. Let loose. Regardless of what you feel like. You know, this is the, this is the thing. God will always prompt us. I found that this is how God speaks to me. I'd be sitting and I'd be waiting. This is now years and years ago. I don't do that no more. But I used to love some TV programs. And I would, I would go about my business outside and know radio, it starts at 6.30. And I'll be there 20 past 6. And I'd be waiting. Oh, yeah, my favorite program is going to start. Five minutes before 6. There's a... On my heart. And God was just dropping it in my heart and saying, Would you come? Would you come? And spend time with me. And I was like, Man, I really loved Airwolf. Airwolf's the gun. Another brother in the house that agrees, amen. And you know what? I was, I, 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 was, I was at a cross street and I knew that God was speaking to me and He was looking at me. What are you going to do? I got up, I go to my room, shut the door. It's got 
the capacity to grow 200 feet high and people make bonsais out of it. Instead of growing 200 feet, it barely grows two feet high. Why? You see, you can have the potential, but if you don't have the belief, it's never going to happen.
so there'll be a sweet aroma unto his nostrils. So go this week, and if you encounter this strangely wrapped gift in your life, be rest assured, be of good cheer, and of good hope that God is at work, hallelujah. Even though you don't see it, if you, even though you don't feel it, He's working. He's always working. Just stand there. Just stand there. And let Him do what He does best. This is how character is built in our lives. You know, the Greek word for character is statue. And a statue starts out of nothing. He's the potter, we are the clay. He's the one that builds the masterpiece. But what the statue does is that it stays there and just through the pain, it involves chiseling. You just have to stand there and allow him to chisel away and form you and shape you into what it is that he wants you to be. But at the end of the day, he's building character the character in us. All we need to do is just to stay in that place for long enough. Just keep your stand. Do not give up. Do not grow weary. Do not lose hope. Do not lose focus. Just keep standing. Just keep standing. His grace and His mercy is sufficient. that's new every morning is where God withholds from us what we do deserve how good is that we serve a good God we serve a good God Father we thank you for this wonderful day we thank you for your word Holy Spirit I pray that you would be the minister of this word I just brought it as you wanted me to but you are the after preacher so I just pray that take root in our hearts and that we will produce the fruit upward in our lives according to your word. That we would walk in the fullness of what you've called us to, Lord. And that we will not grow weary, Father God, but that we will keep our praise up. We will keep our prayer up, Lord. That we will lean in and lean on you, Lord Jesus. As you change us from glory to Bless you and we thank you. For I am a masterpiece in the making, hallelujah. To bring glory in the sight of my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ.